so this uh this week's TOCAD seminar speaker will be Christoph Dorn, and um, he will tell us about uh, the journey from zero to manifold diagrams. Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for having me. <clears throat> there will be no uh, actual zero in this talk, but um, there will be many manifold diagrams. So that will be our main topic. Um, the term manifold diagram is maybe something that you've not directly heard before, but sorry, um, I did get some audio where there's some questions already or any comments. I think it was just a so. one participant okay. who was not muted. Okay, no worries. Um, yes, so manifold diagrams <clears throat> as a term is maybe not familiar, but um, it's quite easily uh, explained at an intuitive level. So manifold diagrams are supposed to be the, the higher dimensional analogs of um, string diagrams. So while for string diagrams, you would um, draw your diagram in 2D on a plane on a sheet of paper in Manifold diagrams, you would draw your diagrams in n dimensions. Um, and the first thing we want to do, um, so that's going to be the first part of the talk, is uh, try to make this a bit more precise. It's intuition. So we're going to give a geometric definition of um, manifold diagrams. But then we're going to find that besides this purely geometric perspective, there's actually a, a second completely different perspective. And that's a combinatorial framework in which we can also uh, understand manifold diagrams. And these two perspectives turn out to be equivalent and this equivalence between stratified geometry on one side and combinatorics on the other side is quite powerful as we as we'll hopefully learn and, and, and discuss in detail. <clears throat> Before actually starting with part one, I briefly wanted to, or oh, I also forgot to say, so I'm gonna follow these notes throughout the talk, um, but if you want to scroll through the notes uh, yourself on the site, um, there's a link where you can find the notes. So that's um, cxdorn.github.io slash Tallinn. Maybe, maybe it's helpful, hopefully. Uh, there will always be sufficient information on, on your screen um, that it's not needed, but maybe it's helpful, yeah. So I'm just going to leave that on there for another few seconds in case people are trying to copy it. All right, so before we get started with part one, let me say a few more words about um, references and make some other preliminary remarks. Um, the material in today's talk is almost completely based on a paper jointly written with Chris Douglas and linked in this first item here. But there's also many, um, there are also many other uh, interesting things to read. There's, there's uh, much material which is different from the material we're going to see in this talk. It's uh, sometimes a bit more pedestrian um, and, and better explained. Uh, and uh, maybe comes from a slightly different perspective. So there's this collection of links here, which, which might be helpful uh, for you to check out. Yeah. I'm also going to assume that, well, the audience today has some basic familiarity with category theory. We are maybe going to use some terms like profunctus, vibrations, um, exponential vibrations, um, which, which you might be familiar with or not. Um, if you're not, I think there's no reason to worry. Um, there's uh, one recurring concept that, however, is important, but I'm, I'm sure almost everyone is aware of that, namely how to think of partially ordered sets, so post sets as, as categories. If not, again, there's a link here that, that uh, links to a quick explanation. Um, of course, some familiarity with higher categories will be very helpful. Essentially, the entire talk is motivated by higher categorical ideas. And the last point um, is that 
some basic intuition was certified spaces is, is great, but I think that's the one thing that maybe I cannot assume um, to be uh, 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 to be a given. So I wanted to briefly start with a free collection of stratified spaces. It's going to be a very brief recollection. So the basic setup of stratified space is as follows. <clears throat> so if you start from your favorite notion of space, so here I've drawn the circle as one, and a stratification is a structure on a space. Um, it's a structure that endows that space with a decomposition into uh, a disjoint, disjoint subsets, subspaces. And these subspaces are then called strata of, of the stratification. So for instance, here, as an example, this additional structure on our space S1 decomposes the space into two strata, namely a point and uh, the complement of that point. So one of these strata is an open interval and the other one is a zero dimensional point. And it turns out that um, this very elementary structure, uh, so the structure of stratification, um, lends itself to then develop in parallel to ordinary algebraic topology, uh, stratified analogs of, of uh, uh, very many algebraic topological concepts. So <clears throat> there's a, a notion of algebraic stratified topology, if you want. One of the first concepts that you need to know about um, relates to fundamental categories. So actually written skeletal here, uh, let's, let's work with the uh, skeleton of categories so that I'm actually able to draw these categories. So on the side of spaces, um, fundamental categories are also called fundamental infinity groupoids. And for instance, the well, skeletal fundamental category of S1 would be a category with one point. So that one point corresponds to one connected component. And then there would be a Z worth of morphisms, well, automorphisms of that point, so invertible, which measure intuitively how many times you loop around um, uh, S, S1. So that's the fundamental category of spaces. And then on the side of stratified spaces, we find a similar construct, <clears throat> but instead of one point for the connected component, we now have one point for each stratum. And I assume my strata to be connected. Otherwise I would have to say connected components as well, but let's just say connected. And now there's an asymmetric relation between these strata. Namely, this point lies in the topological closure of the interval stratum. So the red stratum lies in the closure of the blue stratum, but the uh, converse is not true. And moreover, you can enter the, uh, the, the red stratum from the blue stratum in two different ways. So there are two different non-homotopic paths. And this is recorded then by two different arrows, which are now non-invertible. So this would be the corresponding fundamental category of um, the stratified space on the right. And now there's one more thing. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, my, my intuition for, um, you know, fundamental groups, fundamental categories is this is about thinking about paths. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm missing that intuition now for stratified spaces. What, what, well, what's going is, on over there? It is a path. It is a path. It's a map of stratified spaces, actually. So if you want, let me choose a different color. If you want here, you're looking at maps from an interval into a space. Here, you're looking at maps from an interval whose endpoint is stratified as its own stratum into a stratified space. So both of these are um, 
if you want maps from um, an interval into uh, in, into spaces, just that on the right hand side you have to preserve the stratification structure. And yeah, there's a pretty uniform theory to be told here. Actually, it's it's a bit beyond the scope. Um, okay, no, that's that's very helpful. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, let's do one more step. So we've seen examples of these fundamental categories. One, one thing you can do is you can actually uh, zero truncate these structures. And what happens when you zero truncate is everything above dimension zero actually becomes unique if it exists. I don't know whether this is actually readable, but I just said it out loud. So on the side of uh, infinity group points, what you get by zero truncation is actually a set. You get the set of connected components. But what you get on um, the side of stratified spaces is not a set, but a poset, a partially ordered set, which um, now identifies these two morphisms. So these are things that live dim above dimension uh, uh, zero. So they get identified. Um, everything of the same type, I should say, gets, gets identified um, into the same arrow. And what you end up with after zero truncation is a post set. And now we arrived. Uh, can I just the... ask why why is it a post set and not a pre order? Well, we started with something that was skeletal. So. Oh, okay. You said it was skeletal. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Um. Now we actually arrived at everything I want to say about stratified spaces. So this is the analogy you should keep in mind. So sets are two spaces. I mean, sets and spaces have a, a, a quite ubiquitous uh, uh, relation. Whenever you do one mathematics and then pass to infinity mathematics, you more or less replace sets by spaces. Um, so sets are to spaces what posets are to stratified spaces. Or if you want to say it in, di in different terms, the step from sets to posets is what you should keep in mind when you take the step from spaces to stratified spaces. And I find this helpful, especially for people who are categorically minded and um, uh, <clears throat> well, like to like to think by by analogy. But really, keep in mind keep in mind this basic intuition. It's it's a space together with um, with the decomposition into strata. There's one important example I want to mention here, which is um, regular cell complexes. So actually already non-regular cell complexes are stratifications. How are they stratified? Um, well, they're stratified by their cells. So the strata are um, the open cells of the cell complex. So for instance, this is a simple cell complex. It has a point and then you attach to it a one cell. So cell complex, and as we've seen, a stratification. Um, regular cell complexes are in particular also stratification, but they're very special stratifications. Namely, they are um, the stratified, they, they, they include, uh, uh, they properly include into stratified homotopy zero types. So what are stratified homotopy zero types? Well, they're exactly the stratified analogs of homotopy zero types. Homotopy zero types are those, if you want, spaces or infinity groupoids where the fundamental category or the categorical structure is actually equivalent, sorry, is actually equivalent to a set. So um, the infinity groupoid is the fundamental infinity groupoid should be equivalent to. Um, the set of uh, connected components of, of the space, then it's a, a homotopy zero type. And similarly, stratified homotopy zero type, you simply replace set by post set and the according the, the corresponding fundamental category construction. And that's your notion of stratified zero types. And regular cell complexes are um, examples of stratified zero types. Let me also give you an example of a I think maybe that's the most helpful here, an example of something that's not a stratified homotopy zero type. 
Well, this cell complex is not regular. And we've seen its fundamental category. And its fundamental category is not equivalent to a pulse set. So it's not a stratified zero type. So is the, for a regular cell complex, is the pi infinity then the phase pulse set? Exactly. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. But importantly, stratified homotopy zero types are a bit more general than regular cell complexes. Um, particularly what I've drawn here by itself is a stratified homotopy zero type. But it's not a regular cell complex because it's missing, it's missing some faces. So like just looking at this picture, this is how you can think about uh, a stratified homotopy zero types. Maybe yes, regular cell complexes that miss, miss some faces. I think that's that's uh, probably a, a good intuition to keep in mind. Okay, great. So this is uh, everything you need to know to redevelop uh, a stratified topology from scratch. Um, and this sets us, us up to, to now talk about manifold diagrams because manifold diagrams in particular are stratified structures. So we're gonna, we're gonna use stratified spaces to define them. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going to be very direct and just like get into the definition. We're going to need three ideas, three ideas. And one, if you want, is like a preliminary idea. That preliminary idea is the idea of directed space. So really we're not going to work with just topological space, but we want our spaces to have a notion of direction. And why is that important? Well, if you draw a, uh, I don't know, string diagram, I don't know whether this is particularly beautiful, but here's a string diagram. Then it generally matters in which way you read that diagram. So whether you want to read your two morphisms from top to bottom or from bottom to top, and whether you want to read your one morphisms from left to right or from right to left. So directions matter for string diagrams, and they're also going to matter for manifold diagrams. So the first thing we will discuss is a notion of um, directed space. And this is definition B1 and B2. And then the next ingredient we're going to need is something that goes under the name conicality, actually just a directed version of, of conicality. Um, well, I'm calling it frame conicality, and maybe I should briefly stop and say something about that already. Directed is a very frequently used word in, in higher category theory. So this is a specific version of directed spaces and it's called framed directed spaces or just framed spaces. And that terminology has to do with um, the connection to actual classical framings of manifolds, which are choices of, um, of, 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 of bases for the tangential direction. Um, so when I say framed, you should think directed or framed directed, yeah. So in particular, the second ingredient is going to be a standard concept, which we're going to recall, standard concept from stratified topology, conicality, but amended to the directed case. And the final concept is going to be a topological tameness condition. So we want to prevent certain wild topological behavior. And that's going to go under the name of a triang triangulability condition. Yeah. So these, these are the ideas. We want directions. We want this conicality condition. So far, it's a black box. And then we want things to not look horrible, which is the triangulability condition. OK, let's start with directions. Um, the one insight that you need here in, in, in this definition before you look at what's actually written down is that defining directions. So what we want to do is we just want to define directions for, um, for Euclidean space. This can be amended for other spaces as well, but we only care about the local case, just Euclidean space. 
And the core insight here is that if we look at one dimensional space, so just the real line, then there's almost no choice in how you define directions. So if you look at the real line uh, from minus infinity to plus infinity, then you really only have two choices. You can direct that line from minus to plus, or you can direct that line in the opposite direction from plus to minus. So that just corresponds to picking an orientation. Um, this is why the word oriented appears here. And there's a Z2 worth of choices. So you can either go from minus to plus or from plus to minus. And with that insight, we can now argue inductively. So let's say we have a notion of direction of R I minus one, then looking at a real line bundle over R I minus one is going to give you a space that is R I. So a direction of R I is nothing but well, a direction of R i minus one plus an identification of R with um, an oriented uh, real line, uh, an oriented line bundle over R minus one. That defines a framing and we are interested in the standard framing. And for that, we're actually going to pick particular line bundles, namely just the standard projections that forget the last component that serves as our as our line bundles. This is probably where you will very much benefit from seeing an example. <clears throat> so here's a picture of, of standard framed or frame directed R2. So what we do is we take our R2 and we decompose it as a line bundle and we pick on our, oh, sorry, we pick on our, um, our fibers and our line fibers pick orientations. But then on the base space of this bundle, so this projects out the last coordinate, we again inductively decompose that space as a line bundle over uh, the next Euclidean space one dimension down. In this case, it's just R0. And then pick uh, orientations of, of the fibers of that bundle. And this iterative choice of, of orientations um, gives us uh, gives us a framing and for the for the standard framing all of this is the standard choices so um, really the standard framing is uh, it's almost not worth calling it a structure because it's just um, uh, uh, yeah it's, it's just a convention really Whatsoever interesting is then use, using that notion of framing to define what it means to have maps between directed spaces. So a map between standard directed R2s, as we've just, just drawn them, is going to be a map that's precisely compatible with all of these bundles. So it's going to factor through all of these line bundles. And moreover, well, factoring in this way means that it maps fibers into fibers. Moreover, we want that this map on fibers actually preserves orientation. So map things in the right direction. And that's going to be our notion of a directed map between directed spaces. And as I said, that's somehow uh, a, a preliminary idea, um, which, which we're now going to employ um, to, to discuss certain certified notions. And the main notion is that of conicality. <clears throat> conicality, um, as I said, is a standard notion in, in, in uh, stratified topology. Um, maybe I can already say, so one reference for this um, would be uh, Appendix A in Lurie's higher algebra. And one thing that Dury does uh, in, in this appendix is he shows that conicality is the natural condition you need to impose for your stratified spaces to actually have a fundamental category. So for the pi infinity to work for stratified spaces, they need to be conical. So really everything I said so far about stratified spaces 
you should just add conical to all of it. So we assume everything to be to be conical. But let's let's uh, illustrate what conicality means in an example. So let's consider this stratification here on um, the left. So this stratification is, has one line stratum. So um, let's just extend that line stratum to infinity. We're working in three-dimensional space. So there's like an ambient R3. And then into that line stratum, we have these three sheets that converge into the line stratum that like attach to the line stratum. And then we have also the open three-dimensional strata around around those, those strata, um, which I haven't colored, um, but this is really a stratification of R3. What it means to be conical is that at each point of a stratification, the stratification decomposes into a normal part, or I should say into a tangential part, a part that's tangential to the stratum um, where we consider a point in, and a normal part. So to, to uh, visualize that, if I pick a point on this red stratum, then I want a neighborhood of this point to look like um, a tangential part. So that's just going to be an open interval. So that's like the part that lies in the stratum of the point that we've, that we've picked and the normal part, that's the part that in the picture you obtain by, by slicing maybe in the x, x, y plane. And if you take the product of the um, tangential and the normal part, uh, again, there's an obvious notion of, of uh, products of stratified spaces, then, um, well, you get a stratified space. So you take this open interval, cross this, this slice here, you get a stratified space, and that includes into a stratified neighborhood around that point, um, which is a witness for the stratification being conical around that point. So having this nice decomposition into tangential and normal part um, shows that, or, or uh, witnesses that um, uh, conicality is satisfied at, at that point. And we say a stratification is conical if it's conical at, at any point in this way. Again, it's, uh, it's, it's really a condition that you should always assume. And if you look at stratifications appearing in the wild, for instance, um, uh, algebraic varieties or, or uh, other stratifications, then uh, conicality is essentially always satisfied. So it's really a very elementary condition. Now let's look at the framed, so the directed analog of this condition. So we're really gonna take the exactly same picture, just that instead of R3, we're now going to work with our standard framed R3. And instead of having an inclusion of this product of stratified spaces here, so recall this was a stratified neighborhood and neighborhood means that it's a stratified homeomorphism onto its image. So this condition, still preserved over here, but we require the underlying map to be a framed map, a framed map in the sense as we've just defined. So a map that then factors through all the projections. And for something to be a framed map, we need to have a framing both on the domain and the codomain of the map. So, well, here we've already said, it's just the, in, in this example, it's just a standard frame R3. So what's the, um, what's the framing structure on this product? We're going to pick the standard one. So um, we're keeping everything, everything standard. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the tangential direction, which we always require to be of the form RK. So in this case, it's R1. The tangential direction in the first operand of the product and the normal direction, which we always require to be of the form Rn minus K. 
as, as a space. So forgetting the stratification, the underlying space is an Rn minus K. We put that in the second operand, and then we just take the standard identification of the product Rk times Rn minus K with Rn. And that fixes, on this product, that fixes um, a framing, namely the standard framing of Rn. Um, and with those framings fixed, we then can talk about uh, framed maps. And the frame conicality condition is exactly the conicality condition. It just requires um, uh, the inclusion to be a framed map. And we're going to see one more example of this in a second. Let's press on to the last condition. So the last condition is um, maybe a little bit more technical. So we want something to be triangulable um, and actually not only triangulable, we want it to be compact or compactly described triangulable. And a priori that's, that's a weird thing to ask for. I mean, you might, you might raise an eyebrow um, because Rn of course is not compact. So how can we have compact triangulations or something non-compact? Well, let's look at this picture here on the left. So this illustrates something that I would call a compact triangulation. And the way it was obtained was by first looking at a compact triangulation embedded in, um, embedded in uh, Rn, and then taking some of the simplices, sorry, some of the vertices, some of the zero simplices, and moving them to infinity. So if you continue moving them further and further down, you're going to eventually obtain a picture like this. This is something, well, it's uh, um, <clears throat> made, up, made up terminology, but this is something called a compactly described triangulation um, because it is a triangulation that can be described with information contained in a compact set. And in particular, all of its um, vertices actually are contained in a compact set. And I'm going to say that a stratification of Rn is framed compactly triangulable if there exists a subdivision, a stratified map that's a subdivision. So it refines strata, it makes them finer, it subdivides them. Um, which in particular is framed. So uh, we fixed the standard framing of Rn as before. Here's an example. So let's consider the stratification with the green strata, the red strata, and then the remaining open strata. Then this triangulation over here does have a subdivision um, of, or, or does provide a subdivision of, of uh, the stratification on the right. Um, I've tried to indicate this by these wiggly lines, and I've tried to indicate in particular that the linear structure need not be preserved when you, when you triangulate something, when you triangulate a stratification. But we do require the map to be framed. Um, as an aside, maybe if you look at this picture later, I've changed orientation for my uh, projections. I've drawn, I've drawn the R2 with a different uh, different orientation. So my projections here for this map to be framed actually go sideways, whereas previously they went downwards. And this is actually all we need. So we have this technical condition that prevents wildness. We have our notion of conicality, which is just the standard notion of conicality, but amended with, um, with directions. Um, and this is what we need to define manifold diagrams. So a manifold diagram, manifold N diagram, is a framed conical, framed compactly triangle stratification of Rn. And one fun exercise, which however I'm going to, to leave um, to the interested, interested uh, uh, listener and reader, <clears throat> is to verify that this actually recovers um, Joyals and Street's definition of string diagrams, which incidentally um, also used uh, projections. So they also used, that was wrong, 
they also used uh, projections from R2 to R1 actually to define a notion of progressiveness. But here we have these towers of projections to define our notion of directions. <clears throat> so let's give one brief example um, of, a, of a manifold diagram, well, which is a string diagram, so in dimension n equals two, namely the stratification which we've seen before. We've already seen that it's framed compactly triangulable because it has like this compactly described triangulation, so it can be chopped up into simplices. And it is also frame conical. So recall frame conical means that each point in a neighborhood looks like a product of some tangential data times some normal data. And indeed, so for instance, this has a framed map from the product of just the line times the normal data. There's one thing which I, which I glossed over. This normal data looks always like a cone. This is also where conicality as a, as a term comes from. So it's a cone in the sense that if you take the normal slice, um, you have a cone point and strata converging into that cone point. Um, but I'm not going to get into the, into the uh, uh, actual stratified definition of stratified cones. It's, it's, not, it's not difficult, but I think it would be distracting. All right, so this is, uh, this is the, the first thing I, I wanted to reach in this talk, so a definition of manifold diagrams. But really the highlight is the first theorem about them. So um, this is something that has been called the combinatorization theorem um, and states that manifold diagrams in the sense as we've just defined them, so in purely stratified geometric terms, actually up to, up to a contractible space of their framed stratified uh, automorphism, homeomorphisms. These classes of manifold diagram up to stratified, framed stratified homeomorphism correspond objectively to a combinatorial structure, to something that's defined in very different, different terms, but has a misleadingly similar name, namely combinatorial manifold diagrams or rather normalized combinatorial manifold diagrams. Um, but the effect of that theorem is that if you dislike stratified spaces, you actually never have to consider them because you could just as well uh, uh, work in, in uh, uh, a purely combinatorial world. Let me also say that this is, so this is a bit surprising. Um, Certainly, there were some combinatorial structures here, but these combinatorial structures were highly non-unique. Whereas here, we're talking about unique combinatorial structures. So having a, a unique combinatorial representative for these stratified geometric equivalence classes, um, in a way, is something you don't find in traditional combinatorial topology that often. So um, there's, a, there's a small moment of, of surprise. Before discussing this combinatorial story in a bit more depth, let me give you one maybe useful perspective on this theorem. So really, this is a link between stratified geometry on one hand, so stratified geometry, and categorical or higher categorical combinatorics, so combinatorics of shapes, as we will see in a second. And if you want, that is a directed form of, um, or it's a hint of a directed form of the cobordism hypothesis. And in particular, you can now uh, go ahead and, and reintroduce invertibility. And this framework then allows you, um, or, or dualizability, then naturally allows you to uh, express the resulting correspondence as a correspondence between singularities of differentiable manifolds. So for instance, I don't know, a quadratic, um, uh, a quadratic singularity um, of a Morse function on a one-dimensional manifold or something like this. 
that's what I mean by singularities of differential manifolds. Um, with the combinatorics of, of these uh, 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 higher categorical structures. So you can specialize this, this directed, uh, um, directed correspondence of stratified geometry and combinatorics in particular to talk about um, correspondence between singularities of differential manifolds in a uh, in the sense of um, traditional generalized tangle and cobordism hypothesis, um, correspondence of those singularities with uh, higher categorical combinatorics. So this is something that to some extent we've alluded to in the paper that I linked in the beginning as well. So, so there's some material on that in, the, in that paper, but it turns out that singularities are actually very, very hard. Um, Differential singularities are very hard, um, and you see that complexity also in the combinatorics. So there's a lot of work to be done, and it's definitely a different talk um, to give. So we have to talk about that uh, uh, that story a different time. But I still think that this perspective on the correspondence of geometric manifold diagrams and the combinatorics as a version of of directed uh, uh, of the directed stratified tangle and cobordism hypothesis is, is quite helpful. All right, so with that central theorem in mind, let's have a brief look at some combinatorial ideas. So that combinatorial story is, is larger than um, this mere definition of manifold diagrams that we've just seen. So there's, there's a lot more to be said here. There's an inherent duality between cell combinatorics and string combinatorics, if you want. And then there are a lot of topics which we definitely cannot cover, but I at least wanted to give you a brief uh, overview of, um, of uh, the, the combinatorics at play. And that begins with um, the, the story of, of trusses. So these are the basic combinatorial structures that we're going to talk about. <clears throat> and the way to think about trusses is precisely as the fundamental, fundamental um, categories of certain stratified zero types in frame directed space. So we've seen all of these terms. We've seen fundamental categories of stratified spaces. We've seen stratified zero types, which were things like these. We're supposed to think about pictures like these. And we've just seen frame-directed space. So putting these things together, trusses are um, yeah, pretty precisely described by, um, uh, by, by, by that summary. But as in the case of frame-directed spaces, it actually makes sense to start with the one-dimensional case. So in the one-dimensional case, what I've done here is I've drawn, I've drawn the real line, the real line with a direction, and then stratified it as a stratified zero type. So in particular, something that looks like a regular cell complex with like some things missing on the end. If you pass to the fundamental category of that, on one hand, you're going to get, well, a post set. So that's the post set written down here um, because the fundamental categories of stratified zero types are post sets. And on the other hand, you're going to get a second order, a total order that orders these objects based on the direction of the real line. So you have a set which actually has two poset structures, a poset structure that comes from the entrance paths, sorry, from the paths, the stratified paths. They are also called entrance paths. And then a poset order, a total poset order that represents this direction. And yet further, as indicated by this coloring, 
you actually have, and this is only important in a degenerate case, but it is important, you have dimension differences. So these cells have dimensions. They're one dimensional and zero dimensional. So you can similarly record these dimensions discreetly. So just as combinatorial structure for these objects of the pull set. So you have a set with two pull set structures and this association of dimension. And that's, um, that's the one truss appropriately defined. But I feel like this picture is probably better than actually reading this definition. So these are the four structures or, or the, the three structures on the set T that you, that you see in this definition. And now similar to the case of directed spaces, you can ask about how do these things behave in bundles? And it turns out they um, behave very nicely in bundles. And again, let's ignore this, uh, this entire set of definitions. Let's just look at a picture. So here's a picture of a truss bundle over a base poset. First thing I want you to notice is the fibers of this bundle are actually trusses. So you have your dimension data, you have your direction data, and you have this zigzag order of, um, of arrows for um, the fundamental category of strata. So this is what happens on the fibers. What's, what's happening between the fibers is now more interesting. What's happening between the fibers is more interesting. And I don't want to say spend too much time on it. Um, but one thing to note is that actually, if you only look at the red points, so you only care about the red points and the arrows between them, then this bundle looks like a discrete off vibration. What that means is that these are all functional mappings. So the things that happen between fibers are just arrows that represent functional mappings from one fiber to the next fiber. Whereas if you only look at the blue points, you actually get the structure of a discrete vibration, which means the same thing, but with a categorical opposite convention. So you get a functional mapping, but in the other direction. And the entire thing is an exponential vibration. An exponential vibration means that it's, um, it's actually classified by profunctors. So the things between the fibers are, um, how's it called, collages of, of profunctors or something like this. Um, And these three things, these three things, together with one more condition, that arrows are never supposed to cross. So there's no, no transposition with respect to these um, direction orders. These three conditions with the condition that there are no transpositions are actually fully characterizing truss bundles. So that's, that's actually completely fine definition. I think what I've written out here something that's a bit more pedestrian. Um, but, but the bottom line is that truss bundles behave nicely in, uh, in, in, in families and combinatorially. Um, they're, they're really interesting structures to, to study. Um, Chris and I have written this, this book preprint um, 2021 and the cover image highlights one of these structures, one of these cool combinatorial things you can do with uh, with with truss bundles, so so there's there's a lot of lot of theory to be to be talked about. So uh, can I just ask you? Is this? Uh, I mean, this looks a lot like what uh, what Jamie calls zigzags. Is that uh, yes? Is so that the same thing or yeah? So um, in my thesis, they were called singular intervals. Um, in homotopy IO literature. Um, singular intervals were called zigzags. Trusses are a bit more general, so they're a larger class of things. Um, 
which um which is important and which is a key insight for um, accommodating duality. So um, in this sense, the definitions are a bit more general, but all of these things are related. So singular intervals, zigzags, um, and trusses. To be precise, singular intervals and zigzags are what's called open trusses in, in the book. So they're open trusses, but they're also closed trusses and mixed trusses. So um, Definitely, definitely related, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So we have our notion of one trust bundles. And again, in analogy with what we did in the uh, case of frame directed spaces, we can now inductively build towers, towers of those. So an N truss is simply a chain of truss bundles or an N truss bundle over P, a chain of truss bundles ending in the post at P. And if the post at P is trivial, we speak of an N truss. So this picture here, it's a chain of truss bundles of length two, and that would be a, a two truss. Now there's one more important thing you can do with trusses. You can um, you can provide functorial information on them. So you can, um, for instance, associate functorially a coloring of of the objects. So you start with a bare truss. Actually, the previous truss um, is is the bare truss that we uh, draw in here, and then on the total post set, so on um, uh, the top post set of the chain, um, you can consider functors. And again, there's a lot of combinatorics that can be set here. Um, there's actually, so there's another appendix, appendix A in this document, which discusses some combinatorial ideas here. Um, but for us, instead of general functors, maybe let's just think about, ways of coloring objects and trusses. So we take our trusses and trusses and we endow them with one more piece of structure, which is a form of coloring of these, uh, of these truss objects. And the way to think about these, and this is where um, our pi zero construction generalizes to higher dimensions. So previously we've seen an example of a one truss being a pi zero of a stratification of the line. Now we are seeing a, um, a two truss and a stratified uh, zero type of, um, a stratified zero type of um, frame directed R2. So this is frame directed R2 in the background. I mean, I've not drawn any directions here, but let's imagine them to be uh, standard directions. And in that, I'm drawing a stratification. And this stratification is in particular a homotopy zero type, a stratified homotopy zero type. And what this coloring, um, what this coloring, um, now corresponds to, so this underlying truss corresponds to, if you want, the pi zero of this frame stratified homotopy zero type. So that's the underlying truss. And this additional information of color corresponds to a subdivision, or if you want a coarsening from here to another stratification. So the fact that we color these three strata in the same color would then correspond to these three strata being merged, being coarsened into the same stratum. So in this sense, um, we can encode stratifications um, of trusses. So this would actually be called a stratified truss. And here's the one um, important main result that enables, enables uh, a lot of other mathematics, in particular um, uh, the theorem B, 
P1, which we saw earlier. We might well have another truss. So here's another truss. Again, iterated bundle of, of, um, of one trusses. And this corresponds itself to frame stratified zero type. So, um, Each stratum here, each of these x mini strata here, would correspond to a point in the total pull set of this truss. So this is um, a passage to to pi zero or pi pi infinity uh, pi zero. Um, they 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 yield the same. And if we add these colors to it, as shown, then coarsening this truss will yield the same result as the other truss over here. And the central theorem is that there's always a unique minimal presentation of stratifications in this way. So whenever you have two presentations of the same stratification, there's actually a special, let me choose a very bright color. There's actually a special map called a reduction <clears throat> that, um, that relates this truss over here to a more minimal truss. And the theorem states that reduction is Chertrosser, if you want. So um, it always ends in a normal form. So this theorem states the existence of these normal forms. And um, yeah, there, there are multiple ways to prove the theorem. Um, in my thesis, I gave a combinatorial way in the special case of open trusses or single intervals. And in the book with Chris Douglas, um, we actually, I mean, this, is, this was a book about the strat stratified topology of the situation. So we gave a stratified topological proof of, of, of this normalization theorem. Um, and that theorem powers, for instance, the, the theorem B1, which we saw in the appendix. All right, so let me, let me wrap up. So we've seen that um, stratified trusses uh, encode stratifications. The relation, if you want, is, um, well, if you have a stratification, and you have a subdivision of that stratification by frame stratified zero types, then you can construct certainly a truss from it. You can construct a truss by passing to the pi zero of the frame stratified zero type, which will give you a truss. And then the subdivision can be encoded using a coloring of, of the truss. And then this theorem tells you that actually you have unique representatives of stratifications of this uh, of in stratified space, because you can always pick um, trusses in normal form to represent these stratifications. <clears throat> and once you've realized that, there's actually a completely combinatorial definition of, of manifold diagrams, which starts with taking a stratified truss, and um, and imposing one single condition on the stratified truss. So stratified truss such that for all objects in the total pull set of that truss of the truss, you have that the neighborhood. So the downward closure. So this is downward closure in the pull set, which defines a subtruss. And the normal form of that subtruss, so these square brackets are the normal forms, which we've just met in the previous uh, theorem, um, needs to look like a product. And these products are also particularly easy to define. Um, you just define them by augmenting the chain trivially. So you have a chain, which is a, which is a labeled truss. And if you trivially augment that, augment that chain with um, just maps from the point to the point um, uh, that gives you the combinatorial product operation that is being used here. 
Okay, so uh, I, I realized that was uh, that was definitely fast. Um, my main goal was to uh, tell you these two parallel stories of the combinatorics and the geometry, and to at least give you a bit of idea of the technicality that's involved there, um, and hopefully convince you that uh, uh, it's it's really not. Um, that much of a of a barrier. Um, hopefully, there's not that much of a barrier. Let me close with just pointing out some um, some further highlights, research ideas, and whatnot. So this combinatorialization theorem uh, B one, which in turn is based on the normalization uh, normal form theorem, has some cool consequences. So for one you have stratified geometric results like link well-definedness. And that's actually something that is non-trivial in general settings of stratified geometry. Like these frameworks can be quite complicated in general. You have um, frame structures and smooth structures on manifolds. So um, manifolds in um, manifold diagrams, well, they're in particular, they are manifolds. So for instance, a string diagram, you have areas which are two manifolds, you have lines which are one manifolds, and uh, you have points, so zero manifolds, some particular things are manifolds, but actually they always carry a canonical uh, uh, smooth structure as well. So somehow in this directed frame directed setting, um, um, this hierarchy of topological manifolds, PL manifolds and smooth manifolds to some extent um, uh, collides but you need to be careful with that statement. And then there's also maybe the most interesting to uh, uh, Amar, um, there's a completely dual cellular theory. So um, actually this is the, the theory that the, the framed combinatorial topology book starts with. So it starts with a notion of framed regular cell. And these framed regular cells, um, well, they are just the cells that you obtain if you want um, by geometrically realizing or, or by geometrically passing to the duals of these stratifications that we've drawn here. So if I look at the geometric dual here, then that, oh well, Then that is that is a cell. So um, there's a there's a dual cellular theory, um, which is very convenient. So everything you can say about manifold diagrams, including higher braidings and and difficult coherences, um, can actually also be expressed in, in cells. I think that's an important point to remember. However, much remains to be uh, discovered and researched. There's this entire story about invertibility tangles, differential singularities that have been alluded to, which remains exciting, but very mysterious to me. Um, what I think is exciting on a bigger scale is that manifold diagrams, especially the combinatorics, give you a way of formally and finitistically defining um, a lot of interesting structures like higher analogs of braids, so coherences, um, higher homotopies and isotopies. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think that very likely will, will lead to just, just the ability to phrase these questions, which previously couldn't be phrased, I think hopefully will lead to interesting new research, but I'm, I'm, I'm vastly speculating. Yeah, thank you very much for listening. I hope you, I hope you, uh, took away something from this talk and I'm very happy to receive any feedback about the notes. Thank you, Christoph. Um, are there any questions from the audience? What two? Um, can I can I go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, please, Pavel. Yeah. Uh, so my first question is, um, what's the precise relationship with um, higher categorical structure? So, I mean, I guess I guess one of your um, 
one of your motivations was to generalize the Joao Street mm -hmm. thing, which you mentioned during your talk that this is actually a generalization. So, do you have a do you have a similar theorem, either proved or in mind, that's going to relate these structures, these manifold diagrams, to actual categories of some kind? Yeah. Um, so certainly. Yeah, certainly there are multiple things that we have in mind. So um, similar to Joyan Street, you could certainly uh, think about the relation of um, categorical structures or, or manifold diagrammatic calculus and um, higher monoidal categories. Um, in fact, if you... Uh, if you assume uh, uh, the tangle hypothesis, um, then you could also take manifold diagrams. If you assume the tangle hypothesis in a form where tangles conform with this definition of certified geometric definition of manifold diagrams that I've given, then um, you could take manifold diagrammatic calculus as, as a basis to explore uh, higher monoidal structures and I don't know maybe um, define what it means to be a three tuple four monoidal category or something like this um, maybe I didn't get the indices right but uh, <laughs> <clears throat> on a more um, general level um, there are notions of higher categories based on manifold diagrams. So um, you can go ahead and use manifold diagrams as shapes. As I said, their duals are celts. And similarly, but also in a way differently, um, to other categories of cells, you can consider pre-sheaf models on these shapes. You can come up with notions of higher categories. And you could claim the equivalence and prove the equivalence of these notions of higher categories with other models of higher categories. As it turns out, um, yeah, there's a, yeah, there's, there's, there's trade-offs. Um, so actually, let me, me briefly, so there was a fun discussion with Ors on the end form of this, <laughs> about this. Um, maybe I'll just link it later. Um, okay, but this was your first question, right? Yes, yes. Uh, um, so <clears throat> my, my second question is, um, I got a bit lost in the combinatorial story. So I was just wondering if you could, so if we just stick to the Joao Street case, mm -hmm. what does the combinatorial story look like in, the, in one dimension or in two dimensions, I guess? Yeah. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw uh, um string diagram and then i will i don't know do you have a favorite string diagram <laughs> um no you go ahead all right um try to stick with my coloring all right Oh, yeah, I love this one. It's very good. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, um, intuitively, what would you do? You're presented with a string diagram like this. The first thing is you would assure yourself that you know in which direction you want to read one morphisms and in which direction you want to read two morphisms. So actually, um, I'm going to change these numbers. <clears throat> so the direction of two morphisms indicated with two arrows here, with a double arrow, um, is actually going to be what I call my primary direction of how I read this diagram. With one morphism to be my secondary direction or last direction. So the first thing I do is I project out this last direction 
So look at the projection of this diagram onto a line. So R2 projects onto R1. And what I'm now going to do is to look at critical points. So points where things in the diagram change. So if you look at the fibers of this projection, nothing changes until suddenly here, we hit a, in this fiber, we hit a new, uh, a new stratum. So over here, it's a trivial stratified bundle, but here it stops being so. And how I'm going to record that is by putting a stratum in my projection here. I'm going to do the same for other strata. This case is a bit degenerate, unfortunately. Now it just looks like I took these three points and just projected them here. But there can be other things that force you to put a stratum in a point. So for instance, if you have a braid one dimension up and you project R3 onto a plane, then um, you will be forced to stratify that projection something like this, because the fiber over this point actually contains two points, whereas the fiber over these points here contains just one point stratum. So the fiber changes along this path. So this would be a slightly less degenerate case, but let's stick to the string diagrams. So you take your two diagram, you project it onto, um, onto the line, and you end up with something like this. Now you subdivide your uh, string diagram. Actually, yeah, could have chosen an even better example. Subdivide your string diagram. into something that is definitely a stratified zero type. So it's important to realize that there are string diagrams which are not stratified zero types. Here's a very simple string diagram, which is not a stratified zero type. This string diagram is not a stratified zero type. Why? Because the fundamental category it's going to record that um, you can travel around this point or you cannot travel around this point if you want. But if you do this procedure, would have just, which I've just done, so you project the diagram down and you refine the diagram so that this projection actually becomes a stratified, a stratified bundle. What does it mean to be a stratified bundle? It means that you're in particular a stratified map. A stratified map maps strata to strata. If I don't refine my diagram the way I've just refined it, then this stratum here, this outside stratum, gets like spread across multiple strata in the domain. So that's not a stratified map. But if I subdivide my stratification into a total of five strata, then this is now a stratified map. So this maps this stratum to this stratum, this stratum maps to this stratum and so on. <clears throat> um, And this step of refining the diagram is maybe a bit dodgy, but let me, let me get back to that in a second. So we refined our diagram, and now it's a stratified zero type. Now it's a stratified zero type. Now I can't, I, I might try to go around in circles, but I can't. Like there are no strata in the way. So in particular, if I would draw a few more strata around this, it would actually be a regular cell complex. So. This is before it was not a stratified zero type, now it's a stratified zero type. 
similarly here after the refinement. And this is where you pass to um, entrance path post sets or as Amar said, some form of face post sets if you want, sorry, fundamental post sets, but fundamental categories for certifications are also called exit path or entrance path categories. So this is why I continue to say entrance and exit. Okay, so we take these things, we pass to fundamental categories. Use another color. So that adds one point for each stratum here. So each of these points lies in a stratum and it uniquely identifies that stratum. So there are no two points lying in the same stratum. And similarly down here, and actually the fundamental category construction is a functor. So it interplays well with stratified maps. So let me actually, yeah, forgotten some here. Let me draw the arrows into our post sets. So this is an arrow, you might remember. There's an arrow whenever one stratum, the closure of one stratum intersects the other stratum, right? So these are the type of arrows that I'm drawing here. Particularly these arrows map down one dimension further to other arrows. So you have a, you have a post set map of this big post set here into the smaller post set here. and so on. And these maps, they're post-it maps, they're post-it bundles, if you want, together with information about the ambient direction is what I defined as a as a one trust bundle. The fact that this top post set also has a coloring, so all of these points lie in the blue stratum here, so you can color them, um, color them in blue is an additional structure, um, specific additional structure of this, um, of this truss. So the truss is the bare chain of one truss bundles, and then um, you color the objects, and uh, that gives you a, a stratified truss that represents a stratification. So maybe now it's easier to look at these pictures. So what we did here is let's ignore the orange part. What we did here is exactly the same, just that our directions, our primary direction was in this direction, and then maybe secondary like this. So we first subdivided this diagram into something simpler. And then this subdivision, we pass to the fundamental post set. So one point per stratum. This gives you this post set structure here. And if you look at projections, you get these lower dimensional strata. You need to be a bit careful with that statement, but um, so, so yeah, th there was a reason why I told the story like this, because um, that's one easy way of saying it precisely, whereas in the other ways, you don't say it as precisely. Um, and then in addition to this post set structure, so the fundamental post set, which was recorded just by the gray part of the truss. You also have this color information, which recorded which of these strata were mapped into the same strata over here. Let me briefly revisit the issue of subdivision and why it's dodgy. It's dodgy because a priori there's no unique way of doing it. You can take this, and yes, it's pretty easy to see that this is the minimal way. But if you work in seven dimension, 
who knows whether there's a minimal way of, of cutting things up. In particular, this diagram could also be chopped up in different ways, you know? It could be chopped up in, in, in many different ways. And this theorem guarantees that in all dimensions, there's always a unique simplest way of uh, chopping up your diagrams into smaller parts. Thank you. That was uh, super useful. Can I, um, I guess there probably are some other questions. because I'm still curious. I'm just curious. I'm still a little bit confused about this coloring. So what is the coloring actually for? Is it part of the data of a trust or is it something external? Or is it something that gives you additional information? What does it exactly do for you? Well, um, so this map is a subdivision, right? So a stratified subdivision, I think is intuitively clear. You have strata here and you chop them up into smaller strata. The gray pose set without any color the gray pose set um, is the pi zero, or if you want the pi infinity of this thing here. But pi zero is functorial. So you can apply pi zero, not only to the thing here and to the thing here, you can actually apply it to the entire map and it's going to give you a map from the fundamental poset of this stratification to the fundamental poset of this stratification. So you get a map from the gray poset into some other poset. So from this into some other poset. The coloring is just a visual representation of that map. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So this is just the this is just your visual representation of that map of that yeah. of that post map. Okay. Okay. That's that makes sense. sense. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no, great, great questions. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions from the audience? I think I have another five, but I think I'll stop for now. <laughs> you can. <laughs> Can I, people have been very I, shy. Amar, you should have a question. Surely you have, I have a question. A, yeah, I have, a, I have one question. Um, do you have any idea of how this kind of combinatorial, well, or actually both kind of both the both the, the geometric and the combinatorial definition could uh, could capture um, diagrams and fold categories rather than uh, uh, higher categories so for example mm -hmm. string diagrams for double categories yeah it's an interesting question um yeah it looks i mean clearly a cell like this looks um looks more like a square than anything else so uh maybe it's a good cell shape for so that's what i that's what I was thinking, but then you have this. Uh, well, you 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 have this kind of uh, sequence of fibers that somehow tell you like so. So it picks it picks one direction as the kind of main direction, right? So, uh, so for yeah. example, here you can't have like two you yes, can't have yeah, two yeah. edges coming out mm -hmm. in the in the kind of yeah. vertical direction. That's, Yes, yeah, yeah. No, it definitely, it, it treats these things very asymmetrically, like this direction and this direction. So one way to see this is um, if you, uh, like a, a conceptual way to see this is, um, actually, I don't know whether this is helpful. Like if you, if you look at the projection from R2 to R1, and you look at lines and their images. So infinite lines and their images um, in R, R1, then um, 
this is a discontinuous process. So for most of the time, for almost all of the time, the image of this line is going to be all of R1. And then there's this one non-generic point where um, the image is, um, is actually a point. And from a standpoint of geometric stability, that's a bit worrying. So if you look at manifold strata, you only ever want them to be like in a generic position. Whereas if you would use these diagrams to describe n-fold category, you would have strata in, in non-generic positions. And I think what I'm saying ultimately condenses down to what you already observed, that uh, these things are asymmetric. So um, they play somewhat different roles uh, because of the directedness of the situation. Um, yeah. So. There are definitely um, similarities, so technical similarities to um, how you would maybe set up Siegel spaces, you know, where you first have n-fold Siegel spaces and then some form of uh, globularity conditions. Like you can make make parallels, um, and uh, there's one PhD student at Oxford who's working on this. I, and I uh, hope he gives a lot of insight into, into the connection uh, of, of manifold diagrams and other models of higher categories. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, so, so, so there's definitely an n-foldiness going on, yeah. Uh, but to what extent that's useful, I'm not sure, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, I mean, Pavel, if you want to, if you want to ask one more, maybe just one more. So that's that. related to the previous question, actually. So I'm wondering, just just and going back to my first question, I'm wondering, um, like, what are, what are the combinatorics of um, composition here? Um, you know, like, uh, what what are I mean, how does the common how does the combinatorial um, Point of view lend itself to um, discovering and figuring out the properties of these various um, compositions at, at higher dimensions because we haven't really talked about composing these things right so maybe just you can just say a few words about that yes so um there's actually very nice duality of combinatorial maps um duality um in a combinatorial sense <laughs> um, of a class of map that plays the role of compositions and a class of map that plays the role of attachments, which includes both degeneracies and faces actually. So this is part of the story um, in, in number four. So you have a class of embeddings and embeddings are, I'm just going to circle what's important. So embeddings are maps that are characterized by being regular and injective. And then there's a class of quotients and they're characterized by being singular and surjective. So that's the duality here. Okay, there's also the class of reductions, uh, which I kind of tacked onto embeddings in, in this chapter, but whether that's useful, I'm not sure. Um, so the regular injective maps um, are things like this. So you could have, uh, I don't know, a string diagram that includes into another string diagram, maybe over here or something like this. I don't know whether this is... Uh, this is clear. So you take this string diagram and you include it in this part. Like this would be a singular, um, uh, sorry, a, a regular injective map. Um, that would, this is this. But so in cellular terms, this is exactly a face map. Um, but actually, these singular um, 
injective as the regular injective ones play um, both faces and degeneracies because you can be injective while still forgetting strata you can remove strata if you want whereas these quotient maps um, collapse strata together um, that's that's uh, that's the thing that you don't see in other shape categories that these things can be expressed as as maps um, nicely because if you go to dual uh, if you go to uh, um, geometric duals, so if you go to the world of cells, so geometrically dualize um, uh, manifold diagrams to cell diagrams, um, then quotients correspond to subdivisions. And actually, why don't I, um, why don't I show two pictures? Where is this? Yeah, all right. Hmm. Yeah, so these are um, the first class of map that I've just discussed. So you have the injective maps on top, and these dualize um, these dualize to the phase and degeneracy maps on on the bottom. And then there's a second class of maps um, which is which is quotient maps, um, the singular subjective ones, um, and they correspond to, um, in, in cellular terms, they correspond to subdivisions. So for instance, if you have a collapse like the one, I don't have a pointer here, but I'm looking at the upper row on the right um, in both of these pictures, you can see the type of subdivision that's going on in the in the cellular world. Um, so that's that would be a notion of composition. Actually, yeah, I'm not completely sure whether this was your question, but while well, we're at it. So I think I nicely summarized for ORS what's difficult about manifold diagrams. Um, and one of the difficulties is that you have an unbiased class of shapes. You have a very large class of shapes. Um, and that, um, yeah, is, is, uh, is hard to control um, for, uh, for like getting a good, good grasp of, of what, what composition can do. And I think this is, uh, yeah this is certainly one of the shortcomings like it's it's nice to work with simply sys because like there's just one shape in each dimension right so uh, you really know what you're getting but i guess it depends on on, on what you want but composition is, is very versatile yeah thanks maybe can i just have one final thing uh and this is a question both for you and amar so what's the relationship between the, these combinatorics and amar's diagrammatic sets so I wanted to prepare that for this talk. <laughs> Actually, I told Amar, but I was too too busy. I have I have, I think two years ago, I I read through the, um, through the story with the chain complexes, uh, and um, I think one main difference is um, regularity. So you can have a manifold diagram that precisely looks like like this so which is just um which is just a point which is just a point um without any incoming wires right and the dual of that would be um would be a quite degenerate looking cell um yeah well it's... so so the So, so are you saying that every diagrammatic set is one of is a manifold diagram? I mean, lead, leads to so you can it's kind of a one way encoding in the sense that your structure is more expressive in some sense. Um, well, maybe what happens is the following. So um, there is a regular cell which looks something like this. Hmm. 
there's a regular cell which is dual to this diagram that I've drawn in the sense that it's dual to the minimal subdivision to make this a sorry five to multiple zero type. So remember that these purple lines were introduced to make the stratification a stratified zero type. And after you've introduced a subdivision, if you do a lice at this stage, then indeed you get a regular cell. You get a regular cell. Um, but all of these structures carry uh, additional information. They carry the information of the stratification. So the information of the stratification, again, I'm gonna to refer to it as a coloring. If you want colors, these faces in the same color, because they all correspond to the same stratum. Um, and if you define geometric realization in a specific way, maybe you want to quotient this into a point, and then it actually, like this type of dual is going to look like taking a point, taking a two disc, and attaching it, attaching the two disc um, onto onto that point. So, um, and that's not regular anymore. <laughs> but but in a way, by encoding uh, the stratification, you can represent this degenerate situation um, with a regular situation. Um, and, and from from a perspective of manifold diagrams, the process is very clear like you pass to these stratified zero types, like that's that's what you do. Yeah. Yeah, so if I if I can just comment on this, so yeah, I mean, like, um, I would say that uh, if, uh, if, if the goal of the definition is to encode kind of um, valid shapes of high categorical diagrams, then the way that kind of we do it in the grammatic sets, yes, it kind of it uh, it has uh, by I mean as it, as it looks, I would say that the, the kind of the shapes of diagrams in the grammatic sets are a more restricted class, presumably than what's allowed by these manifold diagrams. Um, of course, once you pass to these kind of two pre sheaves on these shapes, then you can have a. Uh, then of course you can you can quotient things you kind of you extend by co-limits and then of course like even though if you even though in uh you would start from a kind of category of shapes where everything is regular uh once you pass the pre sheaves you or 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 sheaves if you if you if you do it in a if you if you change a kind of different side then then you can represent these situations um so in this sense like there may be I, I presume there may be a kind of a way of identifying uh, these manifold diagrams, not with uh, the kind of regular shapes that we use in the in the original side, but maybe with some class of co-limits of these of these original shapes. Do, do you agree with this, Christoph? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If there are no further questions, I would uh, thank uh, Christoph again, and uh, please come visit us in Tallinn. When yes, yeah. Well, you thank can. you very much for for having me, and it was uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Nice talk. Yes. Yeah. Thank you.